Young Egyptian army officers was planning nothing less than revolution. The year's main event would abolish the monarchy and send the king into exile. Soon, the ancient land of Egypt would be declared a republic. In the years leading up to the coup, Arab nationalism was rising in Egypt. King Farouk was seen as being pro-British and supportive of the United Kingdom's control over the Suez Canal. The Egyptian army believed that they had not been properly equipped to support Palestinians during the Israeli War of Independence. When that war was lost in 1948, officers blamed the king for abandoning the army. His Majesty Farouk I had been king of Egypt and Sudan since the age of 16. The tenth ruler from the Muhammad Ali dynasty led a lavish lifestyle that included regular shopping sprees to Europe. This lifestyle had aroused resentment among the people, particularly during the hardships of the Second World War. During his reign, Farouk came to be widely criticized for his corrupt and ineffectual governance. One of the men who had served in the Israeli War of Independence was Colonel Gamal Abdul Nasser. Nasser had commanded a unit in Palestine and was dismayed by the inefficiency and lack of preparation of the Egyptian army. Determined to change his country, he organized a clandestine group inside the army called the Free Officers. The Free Officers were committed to freeing Egypt from British control and establishing a more equitable government. They enlisted General Mohammed Naguib as a public figurehead and prepared to overthrow the monarchy. On January the 25th, 1952, British troops launched an attack on Egyptian police in Ismailia. 50 police officers were killed and many more were wounded. As a result, Egypt erupted in fury. Rioters burnt down British businesses in Cairo and national sentiment reached new heights. The free officers planned a coup d'etat for August the 5th. When they learned that the king might be preparing to move against them, they decided to seize power. On the 23rd of July, the people of Cairo awoke to discover the armed forces taking up positions in the streets. At 7.30 a.m., a radio station aired the first communique of the revolution in the name of General Mohammed Neguib. The voice reading the message was free officer and future president of Egypt, Anwar Sadat. Sadat justified the revolution by announcing that Egypt had passed through a critical period in recent history that was characterized by bribery, mischief, and the absence of governmental stability. He assured Egyptian people that the army was capable of operating in the national interest under the rule of the constitution. He urged citizens not to carry out acts of destruction or violence. Should anyone behave in such ways, he warned, they would be dealt with forcefully as traitors. King Farouk fled to Ras El Teen Palace on the waterfront of Alexandria. General Naguib ordered the captain of Farouk's yacht, Al Marusha, not to sail without orders from the army. The free officers debated the deposed king's future. While some believed that exile was the best solution, others argued that Farouk should be put on trial for what they perceived as crimes committed against the Egyptian people. In the meantime, Farouk sought the intervention of the United States, but to no avail. The order for the king to abdicate finally came on Saturday, July the 26th. At six o'clock that evening, the king set sail for Monaco, where he lived in exile for the rest of his life. Farouk's baby son, Ahmed Fouad, was proclaimed King Fouad II. But on June the 18th, 1953, the revolutionary government formally abolished the monarchy, ending the child's brief reign. Egypt was declared a republic, with General Mohammed Naguib as the nation's president. Gamal Abdel Nasser was appointed deputy premier and minister of the interior. After 150 years, the Egyptian dynasty had come to an end. The main event of 1952 had overthrown a monarchy and heralded the era of modern Egyptian government. The Pan-Arab Nationalist Movement was formed in 1951 by George Habash, a left-wing secularist, whom also founded the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, a secularist Marxist organization which had ties to the Soviet Union and the People's Republic of China. The Nationalist Movement was revolutionary and Pan-Arabist, it placed emphasis on the formation of a nationally conscious intellectual elite, which would play a vanguard role in a revolution of Arab consciousness. This movement would seek to enlighten the Arab state and give deference to Western imperialism. The group formed branches in various Arab states, most notably Egypt, Bahrain, 
Iraq, and Lebanon. Habash himself was an intriguing figure, well-educated, earning an undergraduate degree in medicine at the University of Beirut in 1951, and nicknamed by those close to him as the doctor. A vigorous political figure, even in his early teenage years, Habash was known to be quite aggressive toward imperialism of any kind. Born to Palestinian parents, he suffered under Israeli Zionist rule and knew early on what imperialism could do to subjugate the minority. After graduating from medical school, he would work in a refugee camp in Jordan. There, he would witness firsthand those who suffered in the 1948 Arab-Israeli War. Incidentally, it was the IDF who were the perpetrators of the attack by overtaking the Lebanese city of Lida, today's Lod, and Habash hometown, while evicting the residents there. He firmly believed that the state of Israel should be ended by all possible means, including political violence. Habash was influenced by the works of Konstantin Zaryak, who was an Arab Syrian intellectual who was the pioneer of Arab nationalism. Zaryak would hold lectures at the University of Beirut on Arab nationalism and the Zionist dangers in the late 1940s and early 50s. It was during these lectures and his experiences with the Israeli Zionist movement and Islamic orthodoxy which gave him the motivation to help recruit Arabs to create a unified conglomerate, which would lead to the foundation of the Arab nationalist movement in 1951 and aligned the organization with Gamal Abdel Nasser's Arab nationalist ideology later. There was some political divergence which risen out of the pan-Arab movement. Syria and Iraq would soon become countries that identified with Nasserism, a socialist Arab political ideology based on the national principles of Egyptian President Gamal Abdel Nasser, who in turn would be involved with the Egyptian revolution in 1952. The movement combines elements of Arab socialism, republicanism, nationalism, and anti-imperialism. Syria, which gained independence from French rule in 1948, saw a reconnaissance within its borders and embraced the ideologies promoted by Nasser. For many years, Syria has prospered and enjoyed a healthy, sociable lifestyle even under the temperamental rule of Hafez al-Assad, who rose to power under a coup in 1963, which brought the Ba'ath Party to power from 1970 to 2000. Syria was at this time a generally secular movement, believing that a Syrian can have any religious indulgence or indigenous to the area, whether it be Sunni, Shia Muslim, Christian, or Jew. During the 1920s, Iraq had sought to implement the pan-Arabist movement into its own borders. And by 1930s, the concept of an Iraqi territory identity among, arose amongst the intellectuals. Abd al-Karim Qasim ruled the country as 24th prime minister and became influential in overthrowing the Iraqi monarchy in 1958. In return, he promoted a civic nationalism in Iraq that recognized Iraqi Arabs and Kurds as equal partners. Iraq was to become an autocracy in time under Qasim's rule and relations with Iran had soured. His leadership was also met with conflicting idealists. Thus, he suffered under numerous threats of revolts. However, the pan-Arab movement and Arab nationalist ideology were not seen as viable assets to the foreign powers of the United States and Great Britain. For years, the Anglo-Saxon powers saw Arab nationalism as every bit as a threat as did communism. It also hurt their chances at having future relations with these countries which saw Western imperialism as a nuance. But there was also another problem. We saw the unification of the Arab people as a growing and pertinent problem which could cause an Islamic Ummah or global unification of Arabs that could threaten the Anglo-Christian identity. On November 21st, 1952, the Colonial and Commonwealth Relations Office produced a document entitled, The Problem of Nationalism. A branch of the British Foreign Office this document was to help safeguard Great Britain on a world power, particularly in the economic and strategic fields against the inherent dangers of Arab nationalism. As the Arab world became increasingly dismayed with the United States and Great Britain's determination for regional imperialism, the foreign powers decided to help overthrow the nationalist leaders of the more educated na Arab nations. Thus, the oil producing countries and the Arab nations would come under fire from the documents outlined which saw nationalism as a direct threat to the Anglo-Saxon powers. For decades, countries outlined above would experience revolutions, coups, and other forms of nefarious agendas purported by the Western imperialists with foreign assistance, of course. The effects 
are still with us even to the current day in countries like Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, Jordan, Lebanon, and maybe even Iran.